This is the last video in our series on echelon form of matrix. In the first part, we discussed the definition of echelon form and how to recognize when a matrix is in echelon form or reduced echelon form. In part two, we talked about the row reduction algorithm that we use to find the reduced echelon form of a given matrix. Now we're ready to discuss the primary application of echelon form, which is to find the solution of a linear system of equations. So here's a typical linear system. We've got three equations and four variables. Notice that not every variable appears in each of the equations. So when you're first getting started with these, it can be helpful to rewrite the system of equations so that we've got any of the variables that were appearing by themselves, we write with a coefficient of one, and any of the variables that were missing, we write those in with a coefficient of zero. What this allows us to easily do is to create the corresponding augmented matrix for this linear system. And notice that each of the coefficients in the linear system corresponds to one of the entries in the matrix. Because we have three equations, our matrix has three rows. Because we have four variables, our matrix has five columns, one for each variable. The first column corresponds to the variable x1, the second column corresponds to the variable x2, and so on. And this fifth column represents the numbers on the other side of the equal sign. Sometimes we'll call that the augmented column, but that's why we have one more column than we have variables. So now that we've got our augmented matrix, using the procedure that we talked about in the previous video, we're going to row reduce that matrix to get this reduced echelon form. If you'd like to learn more about that, if you haven't watched part two of this video series, you can click on the link below. So now that we've got this reduced echelon form, what we'd like to do is try to understand what does this tell us about our variables? We want to go back to the language of equations and variables from the language of matrices. Now remember that all of those elementary row operations that we were doing, uh, whether we were doing some row swapping or scaling our rows or doing the replacement, all of those operations are uh, represent legal operations that we could have done with our equations. So the relationships between the variables have not changed. Anything that was true about the variables in the original system of equations is still true about the variables in this new system of equations. But notice that these equations are much simpler than the equations that we started with. So we've got three pivots in our reduced echelon form. And the corresponding variables to those pivots, we call those basic variables. So since we're, our pivots are in columns 1, 2, and 4, variables x1, x2, and x4 are the basic variables. We'll talk about what we call x3 in just a second. So what we're going to want to do is take our three equations and solve each of them for the basic variable. So x1 is a basic variable, and notice that it only appears once. In all of our equations, we now only have one x1. So we solve that first equation for x1, we solve our second equation for x2, and then of course we don't have to do anything with the third equation, it's already solved for the basic variable x4. So what does this allow us to do? Well notice that we can choose a value of x3. So for example, if we take x3 equaling 1, well uh, then x1 turns out to be 13, 9 times 1 plus 4, x2 turns out to be negative 4, negative 3 times 1 minus 1, and x4 is negative 7. So that gives us a solution, 13 comma negative 4 comma 1 comma negative 7. That's a solution to our system of equations. If we would go back to our original system of three equations and plug those four numbers in for our four variables, we would see that that really is a solution. But that was just an arbitrary value of x3 that we chose. We could choose a different value of x3. If we set x3 equal to 2, then we get the solution 22, negative 7, 2, negative 7. But of course, the numbers that we plug in for x3, they don't have to be whole numbers. They don't even have to be positive. We could plug in x3 equals negative a third, and that gives us another solution. 1, 0, negative a third, and negative 7. So in fact, any value of x3 that we plug in gives us a solution to the original system of equations. So we say that x3 is a free variable, the idea being that x3 is free to be whatever we want it to be. And whatever we plug in for x3, that's going to give us another solution to our system of equations. So here was the original problem, the original system of three equations and four variables. And now here's how we describe our solution. We said that x1 equals 9x3 plus 4, x2 equals negative 3x3 minus 1, x3 is free, and x4 is negative 7. This also shows us that not only is our original system of equations consistent, but it has an infinite number of solutions, one solution for each possible value of x3. So here's the process that we go through to solve a system of equations. We start with our system of equations and variables. We create the associated augmented matrix. Then we row reduce that matrix using the algorithm that we discussed in the previous video. Then we rewrite that reduced matrix back in the language of equations. 
we solve each equation for the basic variable, and then we describe our solution in that way. But sometimes we might want to just describe the nature of our solution rather than finding the exact solution like we were doing in the previous example. So we might want to know, is the system consistent? Maybe we don't care what the solutions are. We just want to know whether or not there are any solutions at all. Or we might want to know, does the system have a unique solution, one and only one solution? Or does it have a lot of solutions? Does it have many solutions? So here's an example. Complicated system, we've got four variables, four equations. But let's say that we just want to know whether or not this system of equations has any solutions at all, or whether it has one solution or lots of solutions. We don't necessarily care about what the solution is, we just want to know the nature of the solution. Well, here's the associated augmented matrix. Now for answering this question, it turns out that we only need to look at an echelon form of the matrix. We could go the distance and, and go all the way to finding the reduced echelon form of this matrix, but it turns out we don't need to. We don't need to work that hard. So here, for example, is one of the many echelon forms that we could get from reducing this matrix. Remember that we talked in a previous video about how the echelon form of a matrix is not unique. It's the reduced echelon form that's the one that's unique. So we've got this echelon form. What does this echelon form tell us about this system of equations? Well, imagine taking this matrix and translating it back into the language of equations. Specifically, let's look at that last row of our matrix. That last row represents the equation 0x1 plus 0x2 plus 0x3 plus 0x4 equals 4. But that equation is 0 equals 4. And remember, whatever was true about our variables in the original system of equations is still true now because all we did was row operations. So 0 equals 4 would have to be true for this system to have any solutions. We'd have to somehow think of a value of x1, x2, x3, and x4 to plug in to make the left-hand side equal the right-hand side. But of course, 0 can't equal 4. So that means that this system has no solutions. This system is inconsistent. And what made that happen was the fact that we had a pivot in the last column. Because we had a pivot in that last column, that means we had a row that looked like all zeros up until the end, and then we had something that was non-zero at the end. That's what gave us our inconsistency in our system of equations. In fact, any echelon form of an augmented matrix of a system contains the information that we need to determine the existence and uniqueness of solutions to a linear system. It lets us answer those two questions of, are there any solutions at all? And if there are solutions, is there one and only one solution, or are there lots of solutions? So here's how we answer those two questions. First, let's talk about the existence question of whether or not there are any solutions at all. So a linear system of equations is consistent if and only if the rightmost column, that's that augmented column that we were talking about, is not a pivot column. In other words, it's consistent if and only if an echelon form of the matrix does not have a row that looks like all zeros up until the end, and then in that last position you have a non-zero. Now, if the linear system happens to be consistent, then the solution set is either a unique solution, and that occurs when there are no free variables, or there's infinitely many solutions when there's one or more free variables. So this is how we answer those existence and uniqueness questions. We can answer both questions simply looking at an echelon form. We don't need the reduced echelon form. But if we actually want to know the exact solution and describe it in detail, then we need the reduced echelon form.